2024, the year of the open door. Our passage, our passage for 2024 comes from Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. See, I have set before you an See, I have set before you a which no one is able to shut. Last Sunday, we gave King Jesus permission to do three things in our lives. King Jesus, you have full permission to open the door. Everyone loved that bit. King Jesus, you have permission to close the door. And it went quiet. King Jesus, you have full permission to keep evil away from our door. I want to continue on from last week uh, in our series, Open Doors. Who knows that the enemy, the devil, loves to distort God's word and distort God's ways? He loves to distort things. Sometimes he just loves to twist things, spin things, change things, just a little bit. So what does the enemy do? He sees scripture and he says, you know, I'll put my spin on scripture. So what the enemy does is he sets before us an open door. So it's not just God that likes to set open doors. The enemy sees it. He says, you know, I'm going to set some doors in front of God's children. And these are what I'm calling trap doors. Trap doors. Things we think are open doors, but they're actually trap doors sent from the enemy to try and trip us up, to take us off course. And our challenge is to recognize what is an open door from God, what is a permission from God, and what is a trap door from the enemy. Has anyone gone through a door that they thought it was from God and it ended up being a disaster? Don't look at your spouse. This isn't the moment. (laughs) Settle down. Not every door we go through is a God door. Matthew 16 Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point. Anytime we see our lives from a human point of view, not from God's point of view, we can end up in problems. Anytime we look at an open door in our life, merely from from a human point of view, not from God's point of view, we can cause devastation in our lives. Satan works day and night trying to trip us up, thinking of ways he can get to see, he gets us to see our lives from a human viewpoint, not from God's viewpoint. From a human viewpoint, this project of this building made no sense from day one. If we saw this merely from a human point of view, we wouldn't be where we are today, but we saw this as a God door that God had set before us. Good news as children of God, we can put on the mind of Christ and we can hold on to the truth of God's word because God's word is truth. And so today and for the next few weeks after Easter, I want to address the three big trap doors that Satan tries to open for God's children. I think this is going to be really helpful. Three big trap doors. Trap door number one is the door of offense. Ooh. (laughs) Trap door number two is the trap door of temptation. And trap door number three is the trap door of insecurity. These are three doors that the enemy is constantly trying to get God's children to walk into. Now strap in, because this might get bumpy. (laughs) Satan prepares trap doors for us to enter, but they all lead to the same outcomes. Peace, a peaceless life, a powerless life, and a paralyzed life. This is how the enemy wants you to live. Peaceless, powerless, and paralyzed. He wants to steal our peace, steal our power, and steal our joy. That is the enemy's goal for your life. John 10.10 says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I want to talk this morning on the trap door of offense. The trap door of offense. Do you know how many people today are offended? 
There has never been a time in my life, in history, where people are so touchy. Have anyone noticed? Now, obviously, nobody in Soul Church. <laughs> we went to a restaurant with the family after, um, after the opening, and the waiter said, can you please order through the QR code? I said, I'd rather not. I said, we don't like having phones out at the table, and we, we like to talk to people. And the waiter got offended. He got offended that we'd asked the waiter to take our order. It's kind of ironic. He got offended. I got offended that he was offended. And then my wife got offended that I was getting offended because he defended me. And we, we sat there eating our cheeky chicken, and everybody's offended. I thought all I'd ask for is just someone take my order. Who knows, sometimes it's the smallest little things that can offend us and we get upset and we get hurt. And Satan's crafty. He's so crafty. Here's what's, here's what's interesting. What offends me could be completely different to what offends you. My offensive menu could be very different to yours. And Satan is constantly dangling the, the temptation to go through the door, the door of offense. It's a trap door, however big or small. I have to be careful. As a pastor, we all have to be careful. It feels like, it feels like everyone is so easily to offend. How many times people say, just be careful. People all say to me, just be careful, John, what you say up front. You might offend someone. <laughs> I've never offended anyone, I promise you. <laughs> I needed some water. Matthew 24 is is the chapter on the end times in scripture. And we covered this chapter when we did our Recognizing the Times series back in November. And the disciples, they're quizzing Jesus, saying, when, when are you gonna return and what will the signs be? So this is what Jesus says. He says, what will be the sign of your coming? This is them asking Jesus and then the end of the age. And Jesus says, here, let me show you. You're gonna hear of wars, rumors of wars. See, you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will arise against nation. We're definitely seeing that. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. We're seeing all those things. And the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my sake. And then verse 10. Jesus drops in this kind of strange little thing at the end of talking about earthquakes. By the way, this was written 2,000 years ago. Talking about pestilences, global pandemics, which we've just seen, Christians being persecuted, which we're seeing, and then a surprise one in the pack from Jesus. He says, and many will be offended. If you needed one more sign to know that the times are the times that Jesus is coming back and he's coming back quickly, right there, yeah. and many will be offended. The trapdoor of offense is actually evidence of the closeness of Christ's return. The fact that we're all living on edge, the fact that we are living in this cancel culture is evidence that Jesus is returning soon. Now here's, here's one of my points today, is when we get offended, we cannot grow. You cannot spiritually grow if you're offended. You can't. We can come to church seven days a week, but if we are living with offense, we cannot spiritually grow. This is why the enemy loves offense, because it stops you growing in your walk with God. Chantal and I have now been together in full-time ministry for 23 years. And probably one of the things we've had to work hardest at to able to keep moving forward, to do what we're doing, is to keep offense out of our lives. Have we always got it right? Absolutely not. But the goal is to live with a clear heart. And it has been hard. But we realize for our church to grow, for our church to grow spiritually, not just numerically, we have to keep our hearts clear from offense. We cannot control if somebody offers us the trapdoor of offense, but we can control if we decide to go through it. 
because you will have an opportunity today to be offended. You may even get offended during this message. I'm going to give you an opportunity to deal with that as well. (laughs) But the trapdoor of offense is constantly available and open to us, to all of us, to walk through at any time. And here's something I've also learned in 23 years. You want to write this one down. We're all different and we're all difficult. You think you're the only one who's not difficult. We're all different. Let's say this out loud. We're all different. And look at the person next to you and say, we're all difficult. (laughs) Does anyone in this room ever get offended? I actually think that the lesson we're going to look at today is probably one of the most important lessons that Jesus came to teach us. In Luke chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus said this. He said to his disciples, he said, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It's actually impossible because the enemy is constantly looking at placing trap doors in our lives. They're coming. By the time this week has concluded, a trapdoor of offense will have opened and you and I will have a decision to make whether we walk through that door. Somebody sat in your seat today. You've claimed that seat. You've been here since the opening. You get here early. You gave seven years in a row to Heart for the House. You've done every campaign possible. You did the seat campaign, you did, you, you did the kids campaign, and then somebody you've never seen before who probably never gave, gave a penny to this building has walked in here late and taken your seat. You nipped out to the restroom and they're now sitting in your seat. Last week, you know, you loved the, loved the worship, loved the message, and you, you got to the exit and somebody turned right. Somebody turned right. You had a dinner booked. You were late for it. And you've been mad all week. And you know who it is, because they got a Jesus bumper sticker on the back of their car as well. I'm so glad those days are gone as well. Anyone glad that Jesus bumper sticker? (laughs) Some of you are young are like, what's a Jesus bumper sticker? Google it. It's impossible. It's impossible for no offenses to come. You know, even the Bible now offends people. (laughs) The Bible is not culturally sensitive, if you haven't picked that up yet. But one day, we are not going to be giving an account to what is politically correct, culturally correct, but what is biblically correct. And so now even the Bible offends people. Now, the word offense comes from a Greek word called scandalon. It's this, I think I've got a, a little picture going to come up. It's a small piece on a trap which holds the bait. Yeah, that little guy's protecting himself from... <laughs> Just wanted to help the little guy out a little bit. There he is. That's Mickey the mouse. And it's the small piece on the trap which holds the bait in order to lure the creatures in. And an animal is not going to go through the door of a trap unless, what, it has some bait. Something's got to pull it towards the trap. And here's the thing. Offense is the bait that the enemy uses to entice us through the trap door. Now, here's how the enemy uses the bait. He gets our minds turning and our emotions stirring. This is what the devil loves to do. Get your mind, get your mind turning. Why did she say that? Why didn't he do that? Why did he say that? Why didn't he come here? Why did So he gets our mind stirring. And then what happens when our mind starts turning, our emotions get stirred. And we walk through that trapdoor. And so many people leave church, they leave marriages, friendships, relationships. Why? Because they took the bait. The enemy is constantly trying to put little bits of bait on the end of the trap to lure us in. So I guess we probably have to ask a bigger question here. Are they offending me or am I being offended? 
Should we pause? Are they offending me or am I being offended? Am I taking the bait? Does anyone just have touchy days? Chantelle and I, a couple of days this week, we just, we'll be honest, we just had a couple of touchy days. Nothing happened, nothing, we just, we're pretty exhausted like all of our staff and team over the last three weeks. And do you know what happens? Little things become big things. It's like actually tiny little things, it's like we get offended over little things and, and this is what we've discovered about the journey. I'm going to just take us on a quick journey of what the trapdoor of offense does, it lures us in and I'm going to show us three defenses for our offenses. Okay, but I want to just show you how this, this journey goes, because this will really help us all, because we can maybe see ourselves on part of this journey and maybe be able to pull back a little bit. The first, the first part on the way to the door of offense through the trap door is we become displeased. That's the first step. Offense begins when we become displeased. Displeased with someone's actions, someone's words, someone's posts. And this is the decision phase. We get to make a decision in that moment. Are we going to continue towards the bait or are we going to turn around and just get over it? It's not, our, it's not the offense which causes problems in our lives. It's our response to the offense. It's not the big problem. It's how we respond to it. More damage gets caused in church by the aftermath of offenses rather than the original, rather than the original offense. So our responsibility is how we respond. So the first thing that happens is we become displeased. Then we lose perspective. Who knows when you get offended and you make a choice to be offended, you lose perspective. Everything gets blurred. We start questioning, what are we doing here? Why are we in this church? Why are we in this group? Why am I in this marriage? Why am I in this friendship circle? Am I really loved? Am I really valued? Does anyone see me? Is God real? It's amazing, we can take so many steps backwards. God, are you even real? We've gone from serving in church to questioning, God, are you real? Because a Christian has offended us. What's the point of any of this? We lose perspective. Number three, it gets worse, we get angry. We get angered. When we lose perspective, we, we feel entitled to be angry. And some of you even spiritualize, it's righteous anger. We just can't sleep at night because we're so focused. And here's step four, sadly, is the anger leads to reports of revenge. We leave. The breakdown of all relationships. People walk away. They walk out of the house. They walk out of the church. They walk out of friendship circles. And how many people have lost family relationships, even people's faith, because they've allowed offense in? And then what happens is it doesn't stop there. Number five is we attack. We attack back. We do the very thing we hate. We do the very thing we're accusing others of doing to us. We deliberately try to offend them. And guess what? The devil is laughing. He is loving. This is like a party for him. Because he has, we have taken the bait that he laid for us. And now, where are we? We're peaceless, powerless, and paralyzed. So he's got us where he wants us. Now, good news. Here's the good news. We can refuse the bait, change direction, and we can walk away. So I want to share today three defenses against our offenses from Scripture. Three defenses. Defense number one. You ready? Back rows. Back rows, you ready? Defense number one. I refuse to allow the enemy to steal my peace. You've got to make a decision at the start of every day. I refuse. The enemy wants our peace. Our peace is our power. What's the first thing the enemy loves to get? He loves to get our peace. You can have all the money in the world. You can have everything you want in the world. But if you don't have peace, where are we? So what's the first thing the enemy comes after? He, uh, he comes after our peace. If he gets our peace, he gets our power, he gets our energy, he gets our life, he gets our joy. He gets all the things that come with it. With it. When the peace goes down, the power goes out in our lives. We can walk out of a church on a, on a Sunday, and then come Monday, we can lose everything that God has done. 
Opening weekend, I don't know about you, but I had no words to what God did that weekend. It was hard even to sum up, put it into words. On Tuesday, my peace had gone. Shall I tell you why? Somebody who knows nothing about me came to the opening and saw a lovely Bentley at the back of the church with the number plate (laughs) J-O-N. So he jumped to a conclusion. Pastor John has bought himself a Bentley (laughs) with church funds. Just need to take some water. And then he doesn't just see it and jump to it, he decides to tell the world about it and sticks a blog out. Some of you read it, it's quite funny. And then someone met me and said, do you really own a Bentley? I said to him, look, I don't own a Bentley, I own a Rolls Royce and I park it at the front. (laughs) And I'm thinking, it's interesting. Of everything that God did, what was the one thing that annoyed me and stole my peace? It's because someone thought I drove a Bentley when I'm a Rolls Royce man. (laughs) But you know, sometimes it's always just the small little things that, and I call these, I call these black spot moments. I'm going to put this screen up and Some of you have seen this before, but it'll help me illustrate. You know, sometimes in church, in work, in life, in marriage, the white is all the good stuff. It's all the things that God is doing. I mean, how 70 baptisms next Sunday night, we had to close it off. Now, I'm pretty sure on the way in today, maybe someone said something in, or the coffee was a bit cold, or, you know, something happened on the way in that was maybe a little black spot on a big white screen. But the reality is we have to make a decision where we focus. And in life, you can focus on the black spot. And yes, someone should have known better. And someone maybe unintentional, intentionally try to hurt you, say something. But we cannot live our lives on the black spot. We've got to keep perspective of the goodness of God. What God is doing in our lives, in our home, in our families. We cannot control what people say about us, write about us, blog about us. We all have black dot moments. And if you take nothing away from today, Satan's goal is to get God's children living in offense, living, going through daily the trapdoor of offense. And we've got to understand his motives. And the goal, of, the goal of the enemy isn't for you just to lose your peace, it's to lose your power. Because this is why I started with peace, because when you lose your peace, you lose your power. Because a peaceless person is a powerless person. You've got no energy to get up and do anything. We cannot control what happens around us, but we can control what happens inside of us. You and I can control what happens inside of us. And I believe with God's help, we can make a decision this week. Wouldn't it be amazing this week if we saw life from a different perspective? Jesus takes his disciples away on a field trip. It's called the Beatitudes. He gives them nine lessons, and this is lesson number seven. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I think one of the characteristics of being a follower of Jesus is we understand our mandate is to make peace. To make peace. Blessed. Who wants to live a blessed life? Jesus teaches the disciples. He says, I'm going to take you to the side of a mountain. I'm going to teach you this simple lesson. If we want to live a blessed life, we've got to create peace, not chaos. Romans 12, 18. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Wow. Wow. Rick Warren said this, he said, it's always better to resolve a relationship than to dissolve a relationship. It is always better to resolve a relationship than dissolve a relationship. Defense number one against my offense is I refuse to allow the enemy to steal my peace. Defense number two, I am forgiven so I can forgive. I am forgiven so I can forgive. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, 
This is not a suggestion. This is a command. Okay, this is a command from Christ. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's say this together. I am forgiven, forgiven. so I can forgive. forgive. We've all been hurt. Some of us, some of you will have been a lot more hurt in life than I am. Maybe from family, relationships, employers, even people that maybe should have known better. But we have to make a decision at some point in our lives that God can give us the strength to forgive. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me just explain the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is this. You hurt me, so I'll hurt you. That's the pattern of the world. You did that to me, so I'll do that to you. You robbed me, I'll rob you. You stole from me, I'll stole from you. That's the pattern of this world. But we do not live according to the patterns of this world. We have to make a choice. Are we going to allow the patterns of this world, which cause offense and unforgiveness and anger onto the inside, or are we going to live by a different pattern? And if we do choose to live by the pattern of this world, this is what I've seen is ultimately it hurts us more than the person who hurt us. But John, why should I forgive? You don't know what they did. You don't know the pain they've caused me. You don't know my story, and I don't. But we forgive because Christ has forgiven us. We are all sinners, and we have all hurt others. We've all caused a lot of pain to others. And you might say, well, I haven't, but no, we're all different and we're all difficult, so that means we must have hurt others. But we have to make a decision based not on what the other person has done or said, but we are forgiving because of what Christ has done for us. I am forgiving because I am forgiven. Is anyone grateful for the grace of God? Is anyone grateful for the grace, the forgiveness, the mercy of God? He has forgiven every bad word, every motive, every lie, every theft, every pain, every abuse that we have ever committed. Today, as children of God, we sit, we stand as forgiven people. Forgiven people forgive much. Maybe you've never got a revelation that you've been forgiven. I want you to know today that you are forgiven. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are forgiven. You don't have to keep remembering what happened in 2002 because God has forgotten it. God has canceled your sin. He's cleared your debt. You can walk in his mercy and his grace, but it doesn't stop there because out of that, Christ teaches us to forgive others. Defense one, I refuse to allow the enemy to steal my peace. Defense number two, I am forgiven so I can forgive. And finally, defense three, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. This is, it is impossible, impossible to do this in your own strength. In your own strength, it's called self-help. We hear so much about self-help and it's all good. There's certain things in life that you will not be able to move past with self-help. We need Christ's help. And he sent a helper called the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of Christ in our lives. John chapter 20, 22. Having said this to them, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus. I'm going to start that again. He says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, having received the Holy Spirit and being led and directed by him, he says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Isn't it, it, look at this. The Holy Spirit breathes on the disciples. What's the first instruction? Now you're able to forgive. Wow. When the Holy Spirit came, what was the first thing? He says, now I've empowered you to forgive, which means without the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus, we are unable to walk past those who've offended us. 
to move past. And so what's the instruction here? I think when people hurt us and pain us and grieve us, I think this has got to be our prayer. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Man, they are causing me so much discomfort and pain and hurt. And I'm really ready to get on that track of getting angry and attacking back. So Holy Spirit, I just need you to come right now and breathe all over me. Because if you stay on that path on your own, you could end up anywhere on those five things. But if you take a step back, you can see the bait of Satan because that's what it is. It is the bait of Satan trying to pull you through that trap door. You say, Holy Spirit, I can smell the bait. I can see the bait. But God, I don't want to walk through that trap door because I might do something that I might regret. My family might regret. So Holy Spirit, come and breathe on me just as you breathed on those disciples. It's amazing when we, when we have conflict in our lives. We invite everyone else into the conflict except the help of the Holy Spirit. God is saying today, it's not by force, nor by strength, but by my Spirit. And Jesus gives us two clear instructions through the help of the Holy Spirit, how we respond to offense. Luke 6, 27, he says, do good. God, this is so difficult. This is easy to read on a sunny day when everyone's getting along together. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who offend you. You want to walk out now for my full permission? Bless those who offend you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Can you imagine if if Christians, if the world lived just on that one verse in Scripture, in that one verse, if, we, if every other verse in Scripture disappeared and we kept that one and we lived by it, can you imagine the world? So Jesus says, I'm going to give you two clear instructions, do good. You say, well, I, I don't want to do good to someone who treats me bad. That's a real natural feeling. Why don't we, why don't we settle at this point? Maybe doing good is doing nothing. Who knows that sometimes doing good is saying nothing? Remember, maybe Jesus wasn't saying you don't have to take them out for Nando's to pay on the QR code. Maybe, maybe, maybe that wasn't what Jesus was saying. Maybe he was saying maybe just doing good is often just doing nothing, not speaking about them, thinking about them, attacking them. Maybe doing good is just good is to do nothing. Maybe it's time for the war to stop. And then he says, bless them. How can I tell when I've completely forgiven them? Because you pray a blessing over them. God, I want you to bless their family. God, bless their endeavors. God, just bless them. God, I know they've hurt me. and They've caused me a lot of pain and discomfort. But God, as part of the process of helping me get over this, God, I want you right now to bless that individual. Do you know how difficult this is? Do you know how freeing this is? This will bring you into a new level of freedom because God wants you, He doesn't want you to live peaceless, powerless, and paralyzed. God wants you to live with power, with peace. He wants you to live with joy. He wants you to live with a clear mind. He wants you to live this week with a new wind in your sails. But it begins by saying, God, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I need self-control. We need His Spirit. My Spirit is revenge and bitterness and anger, but His Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. John, I just wish this, this read like this. His Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and others' control. Wouldn't it be good if that one was others' control? Where Holy Spirit, you'd just, oh, others, no, he says, no, I want to give you self-control. We can't control others. I want to say a couple more things, and they're challenging. They're challenging, but they're going to free some people today. We will never be free from any offense in our lives until we stop blaming others. 
You ever had a small cut, maybe a paper cut? Tiny little cut, and you think, I'll just leave that. And a few days later, you look down and think, oh, that's got a little bit. It's a little, little bit infected. And all of a sudden, there's all sorts of funny things going on down there. I need to see a doctor. And what started out as a tiny little nick, tiny little cut, has turned into this big infection. You need to get treatment. Do you know offense is just like that? Sometimes when things are just tiny, just deal with them. Deal them quickly before they grow. So much better to take care of things as quickly as possible before it has the opportunity to hurt us. You see, the sooner we decide to forgive, the sooner we start to heal. I'll say that again. The sooner we start to forgive, the sooner we start to heal. I love this. I'm going to finish with this. Isaiah chapter 40, 29. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Wow. This is actually a comforting teaching from Jesus. Maybe you're tempted to walk through that trapdoor. Maybe you've walked through it. Maybe you're feeling that revenge, that anger, that, all those things. But today, you're saying, I choose not. I want everyone just to close their eyes. Saying, John, I'm making a decision today. I'm making a decision today. I choose not to put it on anyone else anymore. Or I'm offended. I'm choosing. I'm not going to walk through that door. I'm going to use my defenses against my offenses. I refuse to allow the enemy to steal my peace. Today I recognize that I am forgiven so that I can forgive. Today I need the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask us this question, God, am I mad at anyone today? If I am, show me who it is. Have I completely forgiven that person? Or am I living with offense? I believe God wants to set some people free today. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes, including the worship team, because this is a really private moment. I'm not here to hang people's dirty washing out. That's not what this is about. But if you're saying, John, I have something in my heart towards someone, and today, God, I need the Holy Spirit to come and breathe on me because I've been carrying this for days, for weeks, for months, maybe even for years, and it's eating away at you. And you weren't expecting this message today. This is, you thought it was gonna be a lovely little Easter message, but you've come in today and you've been challenged. Maybe God wants to set you free before Easter Sunday. This could be a week of transformation in your life. God wants to release forgiveness over people today. There is nothing more powerful than a story of forgiveness, but it begins by acknowledging the part that we've played. So all over this room, if you say, John, I need help. I've been walking through the trapdoor of offense, but today I'm not taking the bait any longer. I'm turning around and I'm walking out through the door of freedom. All over this room, I want you to lift up your hand and say, God, I need you. I need you. I need your help in this. I need your help. So many hands going up. So many hands. Can't do this on your own, but this is the first step to say, God, I need you. I know that there's been so much hurt and pain. Holy Spirit, breathe on me right now. Holy Spirit. Just as you breathed on the disciples and you taught them on forgiveness, Lord, breathe on us. I'd love us all. You can place your hands down. I'd love us to stand. We're going to stand together. I just want us to begin to worship. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and just minister to hearts. The stew leads us, and then I'm going to come and pray a prayer. I believe that God is going to release you, release you from some of those things that have been holding you captive in your mind, in your lives. In Jesus' name, let's worship together. Amen. Open my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Oh, break my heart. Break my heart for what breaks your my heart again. 
again. Oh Jesus, hear my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things I see. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Would you break my heart, Jesus? what it is to deal with offence. She knows what it is to deal with people that have hurt her deeply. But I really believe today that God wants to set you free. You do not have to carry offences from the past. Today's not about looking at the the past. Today is about looking at what could be in the future. As I just said, there is nothing more powerful than a story of forgiveness. Why we love Chantel dearly, all of us, is because she has walked a story of forgiveness on a daily basis. We all need that story. It all looks different, sounds different, but we all need that story in our lives of forgiveness. So Chantel, would you come and pray and just minister to hearts today? Thank you, Jesus. Just wherever you are in this room, if you've been you feel like there's like a stirring in your heart and there's like constant tension should I let go should I hold on should I let go should I hold on Jesus. you know that forgiveness doesn't make the offender right but forgiveness sets you free it sets you free Jesus. and in Genesis we read about Joseph and at the end of his time with his when his father passed away he said what you meant to harm me what yes. you meant for evil God turns he's turned it around for good and it says for the saving of many lives do you know that when you release today when you let it go when you let it go of the, the offense when you forgive others it's actually for the saving of many lives your testimony your journey of forgiveness your journey of freedom will not only set you glorious free but it will set others free and it will continue on for the generations to come so wherever you are just lift your hands to heaven come on right now just let it go heavenly father you see every hand raised you see every heart that is open lord the wounds and the pain that is that is open right now in this vulnerable space lord we give it every part of it to you lord we hold on no longer and we say let it go we say release today lord i thank you for freedom over your people you do not want us to walk around with a limp our whole lives but you want to release us so we can live out the god call on our lives lord we will not be held back we will not be intimidated by our past we will not not allow shame and guilt and condemnation to hold us back any longer but today we draw a line in the sand and we thank you that when you said that whom the sun sets free is free indeed so we thank you for the abundant life that is being released on your people right now let god's people go in the name of jesus and we thank you for freedom come on 
also wants to free people here today from the power of sin in their lives. Today, maybe when I was speaking, you're saying, this is all new. This is a new environment. I'm hearing new things being said. And I've been in church for a long time or the very first time. And, but you know that there's something different in here. It's the presence of God. God is here. God is alive and God is real. And God loves you. God sent his son Jesus, as we're going to be remembering next weekend, to the cross to forgive you. Forgive me of all my sins. The Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all got it wrong. We've all messed up. That's why my second point was we've been forgiven so that we can forgive. Today, I wonder whether you've got an understanding or if you've ever had an acceptance that you've been forgiven. If you haven't, this is an opportunity to receive forgiveness. Forgiveness of your past, peace for you today and hope for your tomorrow. Today, Jesus, he can give you that peace. He can give you that hope. Because one day, we all have to leave this earth. We all have to leave this earth. The question is not, will we? The question is, when will we? And then we've got to make a decision, where will we go? The Bible clearly teaches that if you know Jesus as your personal savior, you will spend eternity with him and those who also know him. So we want to give you that opportunity today to make your peace with God, to give you the assurance that one day when you leave this earth, you'll spend eternity with him. You say, well, I'm not ready. None of us know what tomorrow might bring. That's why the Bible says today is the day for salvation. It's today. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Make that decision today to receive his love and his forgiveness. So one more time, I'm going to ask everyone just to close your eyes. You say, John, I want to become a Christian. Today, I want to make my peace with God. I've made some mistakes. I live life my own way, but today, I want to receive forgiveness. If you're watching online, in the room, wherever you are, this is a moment where you can make your peace with God. From the front to the back, on the raised seat and on the floor, when I get to three, just slip up your hand. Just long enough and high enough so I can see it, I want to acknowledge it. I want to pray for you all over this room. One, he loves you. Two, have the, have the courage right now. To slip up your hand. Every Christian praying quietly. Three, just lift it up nice and high. Say, pray for me. God bless you. 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 Anyone else? Nice and high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Right at the back. God bless you. Now here's what I want to do. I've not never done this in this room before, so this is new. But if you lifted up your hands, I'm just going to give you a moment. Would you come down here to the front because I want to pray for you. Okay, so you can bring a friend. Okay, bring a loved one, a friend. Just would you step out of your seat and we're going to cheer you. Many hands went up, but would you just take your time? We'll wait for you. You come. We're going to cheer. We're going to cheer every single one of you. You come. day for you as you make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life I don't know what's got you to this point 
But I do know that God's got a plan for your life, sir. God's got a plan for you. His plan is to bless you and to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. So we're going to say this prayer out loud, all of us together. And I want you to say it, but not just from your head, from your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me to forgive all my sins and failures so that I can have a brand new start. Please come into my heart and help me by the power of the Holy Spirit to trust and to live for you. Amen. Amen. Would you congratulate everyone who's said that prayer?